And so we're going to start off with, a, with about a seven-minute video. It's going to walk us through uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement that was signed 100 years ago today. So let's go to the video. From the Ottoman capital, Constantinople in Turkey, the Sultan ruled over the last of the great Islamic empires. It had been an almost terminal decline for decades. Yet the fate of the Ottoman Empire was to be sealed by the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914. All of the leading powers expected the war to be over within a matter of months. So in that sense, all of them are surprised at the end of 1914, when not merely is the war going on, but it shows every sign of being likely to go on for a very long time. At that point, they begin to think about new ways of winning the war. By the summer of 1915, British intelligence confirmed that the Arab nationalist movement was the breakthrough the government was looking for. Britain and her French ally dispatched officers to sound out Arab leaders. By the start of the First World War, the antagonism between Arab and Turk had increased. The very fact that the Turks were saying, we want to have a unified empire, meant the Arabs said, wait a minute, we're not part of this. So all of this literary and nationalistic revival then took a much more political form, and therefore you got the emergence of Arab nationalism. Sharif Hussein was the leader of the Hashemites. He was the person responsible for Mecca and Medina. And although he worked with the Ottomans before the First World War, once the First World War happened, he saw this was his chance. A chance, too, for the British, who saw support for Sharif Hussein as a way to threaten the Sultan's hold on the Caliphate, the political leadership of the Islamic War. The idea was to tempt the Arabs into a revolt against their Ottoman overlords and create a diversion which would tie down the central powers in the Middle East. Back in London, in the spring of 1916, Britain was negotiating with France about the future shape of the Middle East. Behind closed doors, Sir Mark Sykes of the British Foreign Office had been meeting his French opposite number, Francois-Georges Picot. Britain knew it was vital to offer the French a stake in the spoils of the Ottoman Empire, should they win the war. There was an awareness on the British side that they had made such huge sacrifices that one couldn't just ignore um, French ambitions. And that the French were determined to have their historical peace of the Levant. Pouring over a map of the Levant, Sykes and Pico personally drew in the areas they wished to see under their control. Their secret deal amounted to the virtual carve-up of the Middle East. In Area A for the French and Area B for the British, the imperialists intended to exercise power indirectly. They would appoint advisors and take charge of the finances in their respective spheres of influence. Then there was the area colored blue, which was to be directly controlled by France. This included what was then known as Greater Syria, where the French traditionally had commercial and religious interests. As for the area colored pink, known as Iraq, with its strategic ports, railways and oil, this was to be under British rule. The area colored yellow represented Palestine and was envisaged as an international zone, except for Haifa. Unaware of these secret dealings behind their backs, Hussein and Faisal proclaimed independence and in June 1916 attacked the Turkish troops. The Arab revolt against the Ottomans had begun. The Turkish garrison at Mecca was soon overrun and the seaport at Jidda seized. By 1917, Hussein and Faisal's forces had pushed north and engaged the Ottoman Turks along the Hejaz Railway. The British saw the Arab revolt as part of its strategy for creating a military diversion against the Central Powers. In a pincer movement, 
Britain had launched a campaign from the southwest to ensure control of the Suez Canal and the Levant. And from the southeast, it was fighting to secure the oil wells of Iraq. All this to attack the central powers at their weakest point, the Ottoman Empire. On November the 7th, the Bolsheviks took power in Russia. Within weeks, Russia's new leaders did exactly the opposite of expected. Not only did they pull out of the war, they opened up the archives of the Tsarist Foreign Office and published the secret treaties. The very treaties Britain had engineered with her allies to carve up the Ottoman Empire and to which Russia had been privy. Fearing that Hussein and Faisal might lose heart, the British government forwarded a message to them, reiterating British commitment to Arab independence. The Versailles Peace Conference was concluded on June the 28th, 1919, with the creation of the League of Nations, the first global institution for peace and security. Its covenant provided that the Arab and other territories ceded by the defeated Ottoman Empire should be administered by mandates, which meant, in effect, that Britain and France were given the authority to impose their rule over the Arab territories. Faisal, who had been the governor of Damascus now for 16 months, had been consolidating his position. When he was proclaimed king by the Syrian National Congress, the French were incensed, and General Gouraud sent in his troops. By August the 7th, 1920, Faisal had been deposed and had to flee to Palestine. The promises to Sharif Hussein and Faisal of a single independent state were now a distant memory for the Europeans. The most serious consequences of British policy during the war was the encouragement of Arab nationalism and Jewish nationalism. But if what happened in Sykes-Picot and everything else that happened in the First World War is used as an excuse for the problems of the Middle East now, I think that would be a mistake. But yes, the roots of what we see today certainly arose from the double dealing of the First World War and from the frustrated expectations of that time. So ladies and gentlemen, again, I'm uh, Colonel Pat Donahoe, the Chief of Staff here at Fort Benning. General Jones, thanks for coming. Colonel Puckett, other distinguished guests, thanks for joining us for the fourth in a series of leader professional development exercises that we've had here uh, this year. We started in October uh, with a look back at Black Hawk Down and Mogadishu. We then looked in November at the 50th anniversary of the Battle of, uh, Battles in the Eye Drang with Air Mobile Infantry and the 1st Cavalry Division. And then we met again at the 25th anniversary of Desert Storm. And now today on the 100th anniversary, the signing of the Sykes-Picot Agreement in the midst of the First World War, uh, we meet to talk about how, how a document signed 100 years ago still impacts the modern world and what we all are engaged in as men and women in uniform. And so we've got a, we've got a great panel of three experts uh, that at great cost to the U.S. taxpayer, well, maybe not great cost, but at some cost, uh, we've assembled here at Fort Benning on the banks of the Chattahoochee. And we've, uh, we're, we're distinguished uh, guests, Dr. Lawrence Rubin, uh, Mr. John Gallagher, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Sebastian Gorka. And I'll introduce each as we go. And so the rules of engagement today, we'll, we'll go through the three speakers, and then we'll proceed to questions and answers. It, we'll be here for about two hours. And so uh, if you have a small bladder, hold it. And so... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna start uh, with uh, Dr. Lawrence Rubin. He's currently uh, the professor of international affairs at Georgia Tech and the associate editor of the journal uh, journal Terrorism and Political Violence. And so he's previously uh, been a research center a research fellow up at the Belfer Center of Science and Interma International Affairs at the Kennedy School uh, there at Harvard. And so he's he's also the author of Islam and the Balance ideational threats in Arab politics. And so, Dr. Rubin, your floor is yours. 25 minutes and I'll be back up here at the end of that 25 minutes to ensure you finish.
thank you very much for that warm introduction, and I think I missed the last few lines, uh, so. Uh, um, also wanted to uh, thank you very much for having me in general, and um, thank you all very much for your service to our country. It's a really a pleasure and great honor to be here. Um, some of this you'll see in the video, so maybe I'll refer back to it. Um, I was asked to give a, a, um, a, the kind of the introduction setting the stage, so I'll try not to steal any more of the stage from them, but um, see what I can do. Um, so the 100th anniversary of Sykes-Picot has generated, as you can tell, a considerable amount of public debate about whether this agreement is dead or if it will endure. These questions are prompted by the chaos in multiple failed states in the Middle East where numerous central governance, governments can, cannot control their own borders. In fact, people here may also be familiar with the video that is circulated on the internet of this ISIS, I think Chilean uh, uh, foreign fighter proclaiming the destruction of Sykes-Picot. Uh, he goes on to claim that the Islamic State has smashed this border and by doing so heralds a new era and the restoration of the caliphate. So what is Sykes-Picot and why do jihadists at all care about some agreement made 100 years ago? Why are people talking so much about Sykes-Picot beyond it's 100 years old? And how did it shape modern Middle Eastern identities? In today's talk, I'll discuss how Sykes-Picot shaped these modern Middle East identities and ideologies. I'll make three related points. First, Sykes-Picot laid the basis of a state system that contained identities which were often incongruent with political boundaries. Second, as a result of these divided loyalties in weak central states, transnational ideologies have played an incredibly important role in, uh, in Middle East politics for the rest of the, uh, of the century as a non-kinetic force when often leaguers, leaders struggled to find ways to legitimate their rule, often held as minority uh, regimes. And third, the perception and symbolism of this, quote, artificial agreement or Western imposed imposition through Sykes-Picot would then have a profound effect on many ideological movements and groups and trends throughout the region, most notably of which what we've come to this attention is, is ISIS, but it's not the only one. I'll conclude with a few questions about the future of the state system in the Middle East that people label as Sykes-Picot. So what is Sykes-Picot? As we saw from briefly the video, which did an excellent job of looking at this, it's become the shorthand for the current Middle East state system based on a secret agreement between a British diplomat, uh, uh, Sir Mark Sykes, and a French diplomat, Francois-Georges Picot, for, <clears throat> for its critics then that ranged from anywhere from Arab nationalists to Arab Islamists to, to jihadists. It means the imposition of these artificial borders, the Western imposed borders on a region that should have been ordered along some type of Arab or Arab Islamic lines, whatever that may mean. These groups also see Western, some type of Western malicious intent to undermine and weaken, weaken Arab and Muslims of some type of unity that was in the past. More than anything else though, the Sykes-Picot Agreement reflected the interests of the great powers during World War I and the anticipated collapse of the Ottoman Empire. This secret agreement established these zones of influence whereby the French would gain control of Syria and, and Lebanon, parts of Turkey and northern Iraq, and the British would control parts of, uh, of Iraq, central and southern, Jordan or Transjordan, later at the time from the, from the Palestine, uh, Palestine Mandate, and southern Palestine to keep that, that passageway through to make a, a, a contiguous uh, Arab uh, influence all the way. And remember, think about um, India all the way that way. Um, and Palestine would largely be under uh, international control. The oft-forgotten partner in this, as you saw from the, the video also from the Ru Russian Revolution, is were the Russians at the time who were promised Istanbul, the Turkish Straits, and what today are parts of eastern Turkey. The truth is that if you really want to impress your friends, and I'm sure you all do, Sykes-Picot did not determine these final borders uh, of the Middle East. These diplomats representing their countries were trying to establish spheres of influence. Today's borders much more reflect the agreements laid out uh, at first the San Remo Conference in 1920 and later ratified by the, the League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations, whereby Britain got the province of Mosul northern Iraq, or northern Iraq instead of going to the French. And Iraq later included all three Ottoman provinces, um, Basra, Baghdad, Baghdad and, and Mosul. Um, Russia dropped out of the war um, and, and basically left the picture. 
And then the successor of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Republic, advanced in eastern Anatolia in the early 1920s and basically turned back some of a, a, another agreement, the Treaty of Sevres, that came after that that would have taken this territory from them. So you can see a lot of these things and changes took place in the 1920s that uh, substantially changed the borders from what were these zones of influence. But again, the idea is we're talking about uh, the symbolic effects and how people refer to this region as being the, um, the Sykes-Picot and why and so why it's so important. But the, to get, add a little bit more here and to kind of emphasize this por point about perceptions, context is extremely important. And as you saw, the same time there are many agreements uh, going on. A couple, of, I'm going to mention two of them, uh, the two major ones. One, again, the time of Sykes-Picot began meeting around um, 1915. Sir Henry McMahon, the British High Commissioner of Egypt, began corresponding with Sharif Hussein. You saw his picture up there. Um, I'll keep making these references to Lawrence of Arabia for those who've uh, seen it as well. And Sharif Hussein, again, held the most pre prestigious position in the Muslim world um, at, the t at the time. In the Arab, sorry, the Arab Muslim world at the time. During the war, the British were concerned that the Ottomans controlling the seat of the caliphate would use this office to challenge British colonial interests. Remember the primary thoughts at that period of time was also protecting their interests, which was also the trade to India. If you go further, further east along the map, it, it doesn't show up there. The British then, um, knowing that also Shreve Hussein was uh, needed and wanted to cut a, uh, a deal, having his own political ambitions, um, did so. And through a series of about 10 correspondences between um, McMahon and Hussein, they came up with this arrangement that would be um, for, in, for basically help the, the, uh, the British would, would back this independent Arab state that Sharif Hussein would then be a, a leader of. The difficulty came with the borders, of course, um, and this is where the disagreements go. Um, while the British promised uh, Sharif Hussein would be this leader of the independent state, neither could agree um, at that time or a later on exactly what those borders would be. And both sides had different interpretations, and this would play out later in terms of the historiography and, again, the perceptions of those in the region. Um, for, for example, the Arab state was said to include the Arabian Peninsula. That was pretty clear. The greater Syria, Lebanon, including Lebanon and Palestine, and the provinces of Iraq. But Hussein was told that the west of Damascus, and this is where the kind of the controversy comes, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo would not be included because it was, at the time, uh, Arabic speaking, which was, uh, it wasn't Arabic speaking, which wasn't true, and it was odd. And most importantly, this area was that it was to be claimed by France. And that's the other part of this, of this deal, of where we talk about these ideas of the, the great power interests of the time were the most important. The British um, and Hussein disagreed over this exclusion and left other parts up to future negotiations. But what happened later really emphasized uh, the theme of this perceived betrayal when Prince Faisal, who had gone to Damascus uh, to set up his Arab kingdom, and as you saw both in this video and as well as uh, Lawrence of Arabia, um, was pushed out by the French with British acquiescence. This perfidy was of course, popularized by Peter O'Toole uh, and uh, in Lawrence of Arabia, and Faisal ended up in the monarchy governing Iraq uh, and was later made, made the king there. And to note, the third agreement here that relates to this ambiguity and confusion was if Palestine was to be included in this future Arab state. The British claimed it wasn't, and many Arabs claimed, uh, claimed it did. And this ambiguity was further complicated by, uh, by, the, by the Balfour Declaration, actually right here, um, uh, whereby the Lord Balfour wrote to Lord Rothschild of the promise to help establish a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. So those are the two, uh, the two other in context of Sykes-Picot that kind of help reinforce these perceptions at the time. And two things emerged from this. These agreements had more, again, more to do with the great powers and their interests than they, and competition than they had to do with the local wishes. Uh, to secure those interests, these diplomats who had no particular training in the in, in Middle East expertise, drew straight lines roughly based on pre-existing Ottoman zones of, um, of governance. But as I mentioned, the outcomes of various conference treaties, the French and British mandate system, and so forth, is what determined the ultimate state boundaries and laid the groundwork for the creation of states such as Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, among others, but not, as we'll talk about and extremely important in this region, um, the Kurdish state. Well, these simple straight lines also fail to take into account uh, the tribal, the actual tribal and ethnic configurations in a deeply divided region. The secret maps and agreements, again, generate profound suspicion among the region's inhabitants. And these various groups saw their, think about it, aspirational identities as being stunted by colonial or Western powers and the map 
was basically that was basically drawn for them. If this here is any type of understanding of what it looks like, um, as many of you have had uh, experience either in the region or know about the region, um, this is something of, of well, mosaic would be an, an understatement to say these types of terms and the different identities. And I'm going to leave them up for a second to kind of show this. So the question is, is what did Sykes-Picot do and how did it shape modern Middle East identities? The process that, that, that Sykes-Picot helped set, establish, seems to be this basis of the modern Middle East state system, and it's crucial here. So with a few exceptions, states were created whereby identities were left largely incongruent with state borders. Again, you take a look at the map, doesn't, you don't need to see the specifics, the colorings, and this is just the ethnic uh, aspects of it. If you add the religious on top of it, it makes it even more complex. So some states were created in places that had never been uh, administrative entities as a whole. And what later became Iraq, as I mentioned, uh, was made up of three former Ottoman provinces that may have been governed separately that way and had different elements of population. Northern Iraq, as many of you know, uh, Kurdish, Baghdad, um, and this would be more, much more of a, in, in its surrounding area, parts of Sunni, Sunni and then Basra, um, much more in terms of Shia. And this is also Shia populations that weren't necessarily Shia for long periods of time, many conversions that took place in the 19th century. And each had its particular characteristics, as I, as I said. But now they're under a British mandate and later gained, uh, and later gained independence. Even, um, and then what would later happen in many of these states, you'd have a Sunni minority um, in charge of these. And, and many of you know this history quite well. The same could be said also with the French mandates in Lebanon and Syria, diverse populations. And you had Syria ruled by an Alawi mi uh, minority for, for many years and um, right now struggling to, um, to maintain that uh, regime and, and stability and the state. So during the, these pre-independent periods from colonial powers to these unstable post-independent periods, many states struggled to figure out really whose nation they were. Where did their loyalties lie in a lot of ways? Um, was it to the tribe? Was it to the newfound state? Or was it something broader such as Arabism? This is this new emerging um, force, often used in a, an anti-colonial context. But at the same time, there was a struggle between what was the local identity that they were learning of the state and at the same time, how were they connected to the broader uh, the, the broader region in this uh, ethno-linguistic type of identity. And as many of these nascent states gain their independence um, throughout the 1930s, 40s, and, and later in 50s and 60s in parts of North Africa, the ruling regimes often composed of minorities sought control over the population by marginalizing some groups and appeasing others transnationally through ideology. Appeasing basically if you're going to find a, ma a majority type of state or, or, or ally in a certain sense by using that ideology um, to, to ally with them. These ideologies also were often ways to legitimize their rule over a population that may have been reluctant to accept them. So what does it mean and what did it mean for politics in the future here? This combination of basically militarily weak states and divided loyalties during this transition from colonial rule to post-independence periods meant that many of these political leaders struggling to acquire and maintain power <clears throat> had opportunities to exploit these divided loyalties and minorities. So these transnational political ideologies would thus come to play an important role in politics. The most powerful and unifying divisive force from the 1950s and 60s, and one people may be very familiar with or less familiar with, was basically the of President of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and his, and his Nasserism, his pan-Arab um, uh, Egyptian type of Nasserism as well, looking to basically the idea of unifying uh, the, the Arab world in some type of political cause, but of course it had to be uh, Egyptian-led. Uh, in this way. And it was very anti-Western, anti-imperialist, at the same time connecting also to, um, to uh, return the, basically uh, right the wrong of the creation of, of Israel and the Zionist entity that existed there. And he used this type of ideological or in a sense soft power as a, as a political tool or weapon. Yes, there were engagements in other, in other states, but the most powerful tool he used was his words through through the voice of Arabs, in a sense, to appeal over the heads of many other leaders in other, in, in other countries to say, this is what your political interests should be. And they're able to do this in part because of these weak states, and also in part because there were these types of divided loyalties and this type of political ideology that many, many found very appealing of how they should order their, their own politics, but also how they should understand the region and their regional politics. And he got into very uh, serious struggles, as many people have called, the Arab Cold War in the 1950s and 60s, whereby he started these, these um, 
whereby there's this clash almost of proxy wars between the monarchs that were tended to be pro-Western, uh, such as uh, Saudi Arabia and Jordan, and tended to order, organize their politics and their monarchies around different lines. Um, <clears throat> These also, they did rely and basically result in some hot conflicts, such as in Yemen, where he was directly involved in, but also other places in these struggles to overturn or basically power plays in, in especially the Levant, this core area of where all this focus is of the Middle East, but also, and in Iraq. And exploiting what he, what he did, in a sense, was also exploiting, again, coming back to this, uh, this tension between these local uh, the local type of nationals of patriotism, you might call Wataniya, and the idea of Taumiya, which is more, more, more of a regional Arab type of, of nationalism. And this is what he tried to exploit and many others. But this all came to an end with Egypt's humiliating defeat in the 1967 Six-Day War against Israel, which diminished Pan-Arabism, uh, his appeal, and slowly gave rise after this as a catalyst to a new ideological and religious force of Islamism or, or or pan-Islamism, um, as, as you might have it. It doesn't say that, that Arabism and this type of pan-Arabism didn't disappear, but this was the new most powerful and compelling uh, political discourse in the region. So it was bolstered by, by funds from conservative Gulf states at the time, these types of petrodollars, um, and in the 1970s, and also co um, coinciding with really a strengthening of state power. The 1950s and 60s were a time of tremendous amount of coups that took place in many of these Arab states and, and regimes, but we don't find them as such from the 70s and on. So you have the strengthening of the state in this way from the 1970s, and also control over many of these populations um, and of these types of, uh, and these identities that were kind of kept in check in certain, um, in certain ways. <clears throat> this new trend then, as an ideological competitor to secular uh, pan-Arabism pan was first, was, had its domestic uh, manifestations and it was first thought, and it still in many ways is, um, as, a, as a struggle against the, the local authoritarian regime that was thought to be secular and republican in many ways. But it had broader appeal because this Islamism could travel to, to other states and overlap with pan-Islam. It was given a tremendous boost by the uh, Iranian Revolution, although most of this Islamism was, was Sunni-based, the Iranian Revolution was Shia, but there was a question of inspiration of they had done this before they had, uh, you know, these Islamists in a different sense had used religion, and this is how we want to see our state governments. Uh, this, this is how we want to have our states this way. This competed in a certain sense also with other uh, vestiges of, of, of Nasser and secular pan-Arabism and the, the Ba'athists that, that um, that ran uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, again, though they they weren't uh, even though they were part of the same ideology, were not um, didn't see eye to eye and were, were enemies of a certain sense. What later became any uh, from this from this Islamism is we see in terms of um, this uh, jihadism takes takes its branch. And I'm going to skip a few 20, 30 years from this um, uh, because I only have about five minutes left to do this. So one of the things that that these trends have in common, this is a crucial point, is if <clears throat> they see the world um, as how they see the world, even though they see the world differently. Their, opposi their opposition and animosity towards something that we call the Sy that Sykes Picot and claims it represents. For pan Arabism, is this Western imposition and a plot of the West that imposed these artificial borders that was supposed to be some whole, some organic whole of the way things were supposed to be ordered. And the same thing, even more, also to an extent with the Arab Islamic world, with the seat of the caliphate that, was, that it existed, even if they had those problems at the time uh, uh, and, and rebelled against it being in, in Istanbul and, and so forth, there was still something, and there was still something how they remembered history and how it was unifying. And you can hear bin Laden talk about this um, as well, making reference to what was 80 years ago. So for, so for Islamists and, and, uh, and militant Islamists like jihadists, this is also an artificial uh, construction. And looking back to this time, to righting the wrongs that had taken place when colonialism almost had taken its height, uh, had, had, had been at its height. So today, ISIS harps on the Sykes-Picot agreement as if it were a utopian time, and these divisions, also between Sunnis and Shias, had never existed, or between Arabs and other Arabs hadn't existed either. And these perceptions are important for how some groups did or didn't get their states, such as the Kurds, but let me, let me uh, summarize a few points as I'm uh, coming to the end of my time. First, the Sykes-Picot did lay the foundations for the state system that transitioned from this post-Ottoman colonial period to independence, in which some identities were incongruous, or identities were incongruous with political borders, and thus resulted in periods of, of stability and instability in the Middle East. 
The system created new identities as well, privileged some over others, as we've seen from the minority regimes in many cases uh, that ruled, and kept others in check. Authoritarian regimes uh, promoted some identities and suppressed others to, uh, in an effort to stay in power. This also had a serious effect on the economy and the, the actual development of these countries, which other speakers will um, in likely engage. The second, transnational political ideologies have played, played a role and still do because these, tra these transnational identities um, take place in an environment of weak central states, which we've seen increase in the last five plus years. They will continue to do so and for the foreseeable future. So let me conclude by bringing this full circle. <clears throat> leading, to, and leading up to this 100th anniversary, there's been a lot of questions about Sykes-Picot. Will it endure or will something else take its place? ISO claims, <clears throat> ISO claims to have destroyed these borders between Iraq and Syria, borders it never really recognized as illegitimate to begin with. And even without this declaration, there are questions about the future of the state system given the prospects that the central governments in Iraq, Syria, Li Libya, Yemen will have difficulty in reclaiming control over any or, or many parts of their own territory. And it's become quite clear that some non-state groups or actors may have more power, in fact, and authority than the central government that is supposed to be ruling them. The question is, of course, what is going to take its place and what if the system is, is overturned? Moving forward, the important question for U.S. national security that, that maybe we'll address, and as well as maybe some of these questions that then I don't want to take th their thunder if they're addressing it, um, what are the implications for U.S. national security interest in, in the region if these systems if these systems and way we understand it and entirely relate to, um, to this region is overturned? Thank you very much for your attention and your time, and I'm going to turn the next speaker. Dr. Rubin, thank you for setting the stage for us. And now we'll move to our second presenter, uh, Mr. John Gallagher. Uh, John's currently the president and CEO of the Institute for Global Engagement. He's also a special assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He previously, uh, he has served as, uh, as in the Commander's Action Group of uh, the uh, commander of the United States Army, Cent or I'm sorry, United States CENTCOM. Uh, during the Arab Awakening, and was also an advisor to the commander of ISAF in Afghanistan. So, tremendous amount of operational experience at the, the highest strategic, strategic and operational levels. Sir. Sir, thank you very much, and um, <clears throat> it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I don't know how many speakers you'll have who can say um, they were, it seems like not too long ago, a student here at the Captain's Career Course of the Infantry. And I was thinking, man, that, those few years have gone by pretty quickly, but it turns out it was 1988. Um, in any event, building four didn't look this good, I can assure you. Um, I feel like sitting between these two distinguished professors, I should add that I had an opportunity coming out of company command to um, attend grad school and go to West Point and teach some of these topics in the social sciences department. And then I found myself, uh, after three years of doing that as a junior faculty member at the National Security Council, the Bush administration, um, working for General Doug Lute on the Iraq-Afghanistan team. A story I like to tell sometimes is, uh, within my first week, uh, my new boss said, we're gonna write a paper for the National Security Advisor on counterinsurgency lessons learned between RC East and Afghanistan and RC South. I raised my hand, I said, you know, I actually know so a few folks back at West Point and some scholars at the Council on Foreign Relations who've worked on this, so I'll reach out to them, see if we can make the paper a little bit better. My boss looked at me and he said, go ahead and do that if you can, but the paper's due at two o'clock. So when you're walking out of an academic environment, papers take three weeks or six and they're peer reviewed. And when you step into the National Security Council, um, in a complex and busy time. This was September 2007, just as the surge violent statistics were coming down and beginning to hold. Um, it's quite a different thing. <clears throat> I mention all that to say um, this program that you're a part of, not just the career course, but these discussions, this curriculum within your curriculum um, is very important. I think you probably recognize it, but let me just say as someone who's worked, again, at, at some of the higher echelons in both the Pentagon and the civilian side of policy making, um, serving uh, senior principals, not one myself. Um, there are very few people who ever work at the nexus 
of intel, operations, policy, and the public narrative. And right now, you mostly wake up and work in that intersection between intelligence and operations. But even now, you're learning what is the policy context for what you do. And keep an ear to the public dialogue and public debate. It can create its own force that then drives policy, operations, and that, of course, has an impact on the intelligence that we gather. But in other cases, it can go the other way. How you're able to sort of advocate and operate within that space, intel driving operations helps inform policy and then authentically fills sort of the public narrative space. And it's a dialectic, it's always moving, um, and it's quite valuable in your military careers as you move forward. If you're able to not only be aware of that space, but operate within that um, sort of nexus. So I encourage you to continue to learn, to continue to learn and be bold when you get an opportunity to operate in that nexus. So what I'm gonna talk about today, um, of course, Sykes-Pico matters. And I'm gonna say a few words about why it matters. I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey on governance and extremism and tell you when these things combined with um, Sykes-Pico, uh, when, when they're combined with Sykes-Pico, they can really create these historic levels of uncertainty and stability we see in the Middle East today. Um, I'd point you towards an author, a guy by the name of Roger Scruton. He wrote a book, feels now like 12 or 14 years ago. The title of the book is called The West and the Rest. And in the book, Roger Scruton, a British philosopher argues in comparing many of the nation states in the West, he says, you will often find a people that bond together and fight for what eventually becomes their territorial boundaries. And they bond together with like a shared conception of what constitutes a just society, often on religious grounds. And there's often a lot of fighting. But when they're done, the territory and the sense of citizenship within it track fairly well. And what that does is it creates a dialogue between the government and its own civil society where differences and competing claims can be resolved within that relationship, governance and civil society. Sykes-Pico provides for something else. It doesn't track well with the borders and where people bonded together to fight for those borders. And it creates a sense inherently of unequal citizenship. And even now we're experiencing a security penalty in the region and a trust deficit. America is still the nation that the world turns to to make sense of crises, build coalitions, and be an architect for the way ahead. Helps set the agenda, but it doesn't mean that we can do that everywhere equally and not always with durable and intended results. But where there is a trust deficit and that exists in the Middle East, it's even harder to do that difficult work. So Sykes-Pico contributes to instability in the region today. Again, I talked about the citizenship and identity issues. Uh, that means oftentimes there is a mismatch between the people and the regime. It also creates or, or uh, feeds a perception of, our, of the West having an imperial nature and malicious intent. It also is just simply less durable because the lines are externally drawn, even if they were drawn correctly. And it, and it creates a sense that they're open for revision as people strive for what they, to believe, they believe to be a more just society worth fighting for. Absence a sense of authentic nationalism, it opens the door for tribal and sectarianism as well as extremism. And a system of ineffective and heavy-handed governance coupled with this extremism is simply a cauldron for instability. The level of instability we see today, some calling it a mega crisis, is having increasingly severe consequences within and outside the region. So with that, let me talk just a little bit on what I call the operating system between governance and civil society. This applies where we work in Myanmar, it applies in Ivory Coast, it applies in Kurdistan, China is struggling in Xinjiang province with their uh, Uyghur Muslims and public violence. And then I'll bring it back to extremism and tie it into Sykes-Pico at the end. Um, so just take a look at this. It's just a, a one way to look at the relationship between governance and civil society. In most places, because governance is hard, it tends to be poor and predatory, creating at best a partial social contract with some of its citizens. This means that what connects the government to its citizens is oftentimes corruption and a sense of marginalization and persecution of some members of civil society. And those members go into a state of latent protest. You don't even know it. They still get up and go to work every day. 
but attitudes and behaviors begin to manifest that say, we repudiate and find illegitimate the existing government. Maybe they act on it at some time, maybe they don't. I would submit to you the Arab Spring, the, the sense of protest among the people throughout these Arab Spring countries did not coincide with exactly the day they began to engage in active protest. It was a, it was a long-standing sense of repudiation and protest for um, heavy-handed governance. And then anti-government behavior emerges, and, and at times, in some places, these groups bond together along hardline religious attitudes and behaviors, and you get violent extremism. The reason I say it's a system, and you have to know the system that you're operating in, is because oftentimes, on my own experience as a strategist working at various levels of command, the United States steps in at this point when there is a fully manifested extremist threat. We partner with the host nation government to provide counterterrorism support, build partner capacity, we provide aid, we'll go through the spectrum of help them shape the environment, enable it, BPC, as well as partner with them on the ground. Yemen is a good example of this. And in doing so, we often inadvertently write ourselves into the script that the extremists already have written for us and their host nation government. So I sometimes say, and the, and the Oscar goes to. The end result of this is near-term addressing of a violent extremist threat that's manifested, but longer term, it's like scratching poison ivy. There is an urge to address a threat in the near term, in the longer term, the threat continues to grow. And in the current environment, what we sometimes say, the fourth industrial revolution, a little book by a guy named Klaus Schwab, uh, he runs the World Economic Forum, the diffusion of power and information revolution away from states allows these threats to communicate they have access to violent means, and they can travel across borders more easily than ever before. And so this ruptured system isn't as easily containable if it ever was. And it winds up stoking regional rivalries that already exist. External stakeholders begin to array themselves on different sides of the instability. Think in the case of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, um, Russia, um, Syria, Iran, arraying themselves on one side of the counter-ISIS fight. The United States, in part Iraq, in part Turkey, NATO, in part Saudi Arabia, arraying themselves on the other side. What it does is it puts not only regional powers, but external powers one step closer to provocations and missteps that can lead to broader conflict. So a question then would be, in the context of extremism, are our responses doing more harm than good? You've paid attention over the last 10 years and you've heard both sides of the political aisle say that the threat from violent extremism would go down. But look what's really happened. More than a decade of these projections that the ideology is bankrupt <clears throat> has proven incorrect. The threat trajectory was seemingly confirmed and hastened by the death of Osama bin Laden and the onset of the Arab Spring. Yet, the number of terror groups, geography they control, Resonance of their worldview, foreign supporters, virtual followers, have all increased. Additionally, the foreign fighter or homegrown actor's threat diminishes the separation between threats abroad and threats at home. This is the trajectory. This is an article by Seth Jones at Rand, I think middle of 2014. And he talks about his, uh, his term, Salafi jihadist groups active in the world on 9-11, 19 or 20, active in the world in 2013, 49 to 50 groups. Number of participants, high estimate, over 100,000 in the world. That's, again, that's three years ago. 11,000 terrorism-related deaths in 2012 jumps to 33,000 in 2014. And domestic attacks, though fewer in number, as we've seen in Brussels, Paris twice, San Bernardino, have a much outsized impact politically. So is it easy to say then, after showing you these predatory governance triangles or these pyramids, that bad governance equals violent extremism? Not quite. There's a whole lot of bad governance in Africa and other places. So there is some type of a cauldron when coupling um, hardline interpretations of, of an ideology as well as these um, bad governance relationships that, that uh, we see so prominently in the Middle East. So what does it really mean to say the ideology matters? 
Well, there's been a great debate. Is there a religious basis? Graham Wood wrote an article in The Atlantic describing the religious basis or prophetic methodology. Um, this debate has raged on for many years. Um, some on one side say there's no connection between the violent extremism and the broader religious tradition. Others say they only see the violent extremism in the broader religious tradition. But let me take uh, religion out of it for a minute and ask you to consider a worldview that, that advocates an origin, meaning, purpose of life, moral norms that constitute a just society, one that's rightly ordered, one that the people feel is worth advocating for, striving for, fighting, maybe even killing or dying for, and one that has the component built within it of what I call a generational transfer, meaning whatever that worldview is about a just society and what these moral norms are, it's worth passing on between a mother and her child because generationally, the people believe that it is the, the way to justice and human flourishing, when, which guarantees that there will be some component of compassion, some component of survival, and some component of proliferation within the worldview. Everybody's got one of those. I would submit if you don't, you're probably in between them. But everybody's got some story on what they consider a just society and their own story on the origin, meaning, and purpose of life. This is really powerful because in the case of violent extremism, there's an appeal to heaven that goes beyond any appeal to Marx, Engels, or Lenin, or other uh, man-made ideologies like, you know, uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf, for example. So when, when fighters believe that they're tapping into something that has authority beyond any other source of authority in this world, it creates, I would argue, as virulent and ominous an ism as we've ever faced. So I'm gonna give you on one slide, and I think Dr. Gorka can improve on this. He's the real expert, but I'm gonna give you on one slide, in a nutshell, what this violent extremist worldview argues and how it attempts to create resonance with people from as far away as Europe and the United States to say, come join the caliphate or the caliphate will come to you. Islam, in quotations here, is the only legitimate ordering of society. It connects all persons on the basis of belief, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or background. Once established across both public and private spheres, this ideology will lead to restoration, strength, even dominance, culturally, economically, politically, and militarily. Its adherents believe that restoration is its rightful place. Those who do not conform to this approach, that is those who bow down to man-made authority and structures are impediments to the restoration. People, communities, governments, and heritage that do this must be converted, killed, controlled, toppled, or smashed. The faithful who step on the battlefield have already won a great internal struggle against temptations, fear, and hindrances. They may find themselves in a physically or materially inferior position, but remain superior. If they die in the struggle, reward and veneration are even greater. U.S. foreign policy is crusaderism by another name, seeking to prop up illegitimate governments and perpetuate relative poverty and powerlessness in the region. There's a control mechanism, no criticism and no exit. The ground matters. The earth between Haqqani and Helmand is not as valuable in this narrative as the earth where ISIS currently operates. Nations will array against the threat, but victory is assured. Come to the caliphate or it will come to you. If you can't, fight where you are. Be on the right side of God, history, and truth. The point is, this doesn't resonate with the Western construct of how the U.S. wants to engage with the world. And it doesn't even resonate with the majority of anyone, but it doesn't have to. To perpetuate the instability that we see in the Middle East today, it only has to re resonate with a small percentage of, of people, and it's working. How does it actually work in practice? I'll keep this slide short, I don't wanna get bogged down, but I would submit to you there are three um, inputs that cause somebody to be persuaded by the narrative that I just described. One is intrinsic motivation. I used to use this with my cadets to explain why they in fact were at West Point and in my class. I would say your individual participation in something like a movement or a cause that you find noble accrues a benefit to others who you're affiliated with, and you're motivated to do this because you believe in 
uh, what it provides, some social good. Individual incentives are things that accrue to you as an individual, even for sitting here. You might be in the Army because you believe we're the Army, and we are, that goes out to help find and protect Anne Frank versus other armies that are looking for her to put her in a concentration camp. That's intrinsic motivation. These individual incentives are your pay, your vacation time, adventure, where you get to live, the friends that you meet. In the case of violent extremism, there is the non-falsifiable promise of reward in heaven. And then thirdly, there's social identity. It's that thing that you experience when you go home at Christmas time during the holidays and you turn to your family and they say, thanks for serving. Your standing is elevated just a little bit because you've stepped up to be a part of this movement. And that matters so much that we find these three factors at work in every case when somebody decides to participate in a violent extremist movement. However, they vary so greatly that it's very difficult to profile. You might find someone motivated by the broader cause and that person is a well-paid lawyer and isn't inspired by the individual incentives at all. But the combination of these three things plays a role. And our ability to really dissuade and deter people from engaging in violent extremist um, movements and behaviors, it depends on finding some ways to delegitimize and um, impede these factors. Quite difficult. Again, you have to decide what I just told you, what basis it has within the broader religious tradition. Going all the way back to Ibn Taymiyyah in the late 12th century, the doctrine is fairly well established as a hardline, virulent ideology that is painstakingly weaving itself into a world religion. I offer up this picture to say, these are discussions that you and all policymakers need to have. How do we view this, this um, broader um, part of the world? Do we see that the hardline versions of Islamism represent two of the nine, meaning there are two different strains competing for influence on this entire side of the Rubik's Cube. Others will say it's the entire side, don't you know? Others will say there's no relationship, as I've said, between violent extremism and the religious tradition. Um, I'll leave it up to um, Dr. Gorka to speak a little bit more to that. Um, many of you have probably seen this video. It is a, I won't play it, but it is a masterful piece of um, uh, propaganda. And it describes in many ways that, that worldview that I just shared earlier that says, if you are courageous and you believe in the highest authority, you must join us. So now let me tie it back a little bit on two slides here to Sykes-Pico. So what? Illegitimate and artificial drawing of Middle East borders, negative perceptions of the West and our ability to engage um, to help provide solutions to the instability. As I said, it tends toward a partial social contract, unequal citizenship. But it, what it also does is it reinforces rule by power or force or some other identity, not rule by politics and the political process. And so if you follow me down here to the last third of the slide, look at all of the things that have converged in the last few years while Sykes-Pico has crept up on its 100th anniversary. We invaded Iraq in 2003. The Iranian threat network and Iran's malign activities have been quite active throughout the region. There has been a wide migration and spread of violent extremist organizations. The U.S. had an election in 2008, and President Obama ran in contrast to President Bush. Some would call Bush a maximalist, a President Obama or a trencher. Um, the perception of disengagement from the region is quite strong. In the Arab Spring, we didn't quite come alongside partners who were seeking our partnership as quickly and deeply as we intended. Sequestration is a serious fiscal correction that has limited our ability to do so. We announced the Asia-Pacific rebalance. We announced the intent to be energy independent. And there were some announced red lines we didn't follow through on for reasons of policy debate. But all taken together, it gives the region a sense that we might be disengaging from it, and that causes hedging behavior. And then, of course, we all know the Kurdish question, Kurdish question lingers as they seek to declare independence. They're not really capable of doing it now at $40 a barrel of oil, um, but it's always on their mind, uh, and we've been working closely with them in the last several years. Um, so what does it mean? What, what do we do differently then? Well, I'll summarize this slide quickly to say the United States in the last 15 years has figured out that our level of engagement and expenditure in the world is unsustainable. And we've been moving towards a more sustainable type of engagement with the world. 
and unsustainable to sustainable to some looks like disengagement. But what we're really trying to do is be um, more focused on truly what are our priorities around the world, where we should posture our forces and assets, where we should partner to account for that posture, and then um, how we need to adapt our plans. You know, the big black three inch ring binders on the shelf that are dusty and were written, these contingency plans were written at the Pentagon for a time when we had much greater resources. We've got to adjust priorities, posture, partner, and plans. And my last three years with General Dempsey have shown us uh, to be seriously attempting to do that. But again, we are facing a environment that is so unstable as to be described by some as kaleidoscopic. Nonlinear um, battlefields are difficult, but battlefields described as kaleidoscopic mean even when you take some action that is intended to have a positive input, you may not get the positive input, but you may be just as likely to get a counterproductive output once you introduce lethal force or partnership. It's like turning the kaleidoscope and what that does is it makes us a little bit hesitant to jump right into a region that's this complex. All this is, I'll skip right through it, it's the positive version of the negative pyramid that I described where good governance connects to its civil society through a more inclusive social contract, rule of law, and equal citizenship. In many ways, that's the goal of what my current organization does. We work with governments and civil society to bring this about. I will ask you in the three or four minutes I have left to consider um, two approaches that might offer up some progress where our inputs lead to the outputs that we seek. Number one, and stay with me in this analogy, as I, as I um, simulate throwing a red ping pong ball into the corner of this room, the red ping pong ball represents militant ideas and actors within the quote unquote Muslim world. Let's say by ratio, I fill the rest of the room with white ping pong balls. The white ping pong balls aren't necessarily pro-American by any means, but these are constructive actors within the region that we can work with. Let's say that's the right ratio. Maybe you'd add 10 more red ping pong balls in the corner to make the ratio right or 100. But in any event, some ratio between red and white, I ask you to consider that. Our counterterrorism policy over the last 15 years has largely been to crash into the room through the white ping pong balls looking for the red. And what that does is it overlooks the relationship between the white ping pong balls to one another super influencers, credible and constructive voices within the white ping pong balls who can do two things. They can not only annihilate and delegitimize the ideas of the red ping pong balls, the militant actors, but they can help organize collective action. So not only do the ideas get annihilated, but the threat gets physically annihilated. And that makes our job instead of a us versus them, it's a them versus them. And our job is to enable the constructive majority to annihilate the destructive minority. Looking only at the bottom of this slide, I would, I would submit to you that whole of government does not mean all instruments of national power. Whole of government is only one side of the issue. We have to work across lines like never before. Civ, mill, government, civil society, public, private, human technology, secular, religious, domestic, international, and with allies and frenemies, non-traditional allies. This is the last thing I'll show you. Um, it's applying this concept of constructive majority and destructive minority to um, an example, let's say the attacks in Paris. And in the attacks in Paris, you see in the top picture, the streets are filled with security. In the middle picture, this young uh, French Muslim is saying, terrorism is not Islam. And in the, in the third picture, there's someone grieving over a lost loved one. What do you think the grieving person believes? I want more security or terrorism is not Islam? How France or how Paris goes after such attacks determines on how well these um, different stakeholders interact with one another. So if you would for a moment just look at the diagram, and again, I'll end on this. I would submit to you that A in this analogy is the host nation majority of French citizens, not Muslim. B is the majority of French citizens that are Muslim, the, basically the majority of uh, Muslim citizens in France. And C represents the destructive minority, extremist-minded individuals who have engaged in brutal public violence. The minute an attack by C occurs, A and B have, have choices to make. A has to do what only it can do. 
It can provide security, surveillance, rule of law, a fair justice process, economic and job opportunities, things that the state can provide, and it has to. But B can provide things related to familial engagement, religious delegitimization, and engagement in Muslim communities. And if A and B both do what only they can do, they will fall into each other's arms and they will achieve a level of trust and integration that will diminish the appeal of C. But if A and B don't do that, what happens then is A, the majority of French non-Muslims begin to view all Muslims in France through the actions of C. And then what happens is B and C combine together and they begin to view all of French society as hostile to the, their Muslim citizens. You can see very quickly that this situation spirals down, downward. And once the genie is out of the bottle, it can take a generation to restore trust and engagement um, uh, again. And although I'm describing uh, Paris in this scenario, for those of you tracking domestic unrest in the US, this same model would apply, I think, to Ferguson, Missouri. So with that, I'll wrap up by asking you just to remember, countering a globalized violent extremist threat is among the most complex things in modern uh, security studies. Extreme ideology matters, but it doesn't emerge in a vacuum, nor will it recede without positive engagement with religion that can delegitimize it. Civilization, nations on the same side of what is, we would describe as civilization, must work together across lines. Few nations with global hard and soft power capacity can help set international CT agenda and response. Defining the problem correctly and approaching it in a way that leads not to scratching poison ivy but positive outcomes is imperative. And finally, be strategic and be bold. There were many years when I was at the NSC and I felt that, and, and Dr. Gorka and I would meet sometimes for coffee, and we felt that the extremism component of this threat and the violent extremist groups migrating around the world was gonna become prominent, even the center of gravity in our approach. And this was 07, even sooner for Dr. Gorka. And uh, I don't know that I was as bold as I should have been in some of the jobs that I held to really put this forcefully in front of the, uh, the policy process that I was a small part of. I would encourage you to do that as you um, rise up the ranks and are increasingly invited into that nexus of intel ops, policy, and public narrative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. The next and our uh, final of our three speakers, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, currently uh, the professor of military theory at the Marine Corps University on Irregular Warfare. He's also the chairman of the Threat Knowledge Group in McLean, Virginia. Previously, uh, he was the Associate Dean of Congressional Affairs and Relations to the Special Operations Community at the National Defense University. He's also the author of Defeating Jihad, The Winnable War. Dr. Gorka. <laughs> Right now in the side of Hashem, as you can see, this is the so-called border of Sykes Pico. Alhamdulillah, we don't recognize it and we will never recognize it. Inshallah, this is not the first border we will break. Inshallah, we will break other borders also, but we start with this, Inshallah. So Inshallah, if we walk, Inshallah, we cross the border. And we see that, Alhamdulillah, there used to be the stuff of the army used to stand here. We used to stand here. This is the so-called border with the police and the, the people used to pass. Alhamdulillah, there's nobody now except the, the soldiers of the al Islam. So Alhamdulillah, inshallah, we cross the border. Bismillah. This is the so-called checkpoint for the soldiers of uh, Maliki Shistan. Alhamdulillah. And as you can see here, it's a sign. It says, Commandos Battalion Border. The only commandos in battalion here is the Battalion of Islam, inshallah ta'ala. And as you can see, this is under our feet right now. That's how Abu Bakr al-Baghdad used to say, he's the breaker of barriers. Inshallah, we'll break the barrier of Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, all the countries, inshallah, until we reach Quds, inshallah ta'ala. It's the first barriers of many barriers we will break, inshallah ta'ala. We're coming, inshallah ta'ala. 
لن يعود النصر إلا بدماء الشهداء This is like a map of the border. This is Iraq, this is Sham. So now, this is all dola, one country, inshallah, one dola, inshallah. One umma, inshallah. There is no more border, khalas. This is the flag of Iraq. Flag of Shirk, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, "Whoever calls to nationality is not from me." So we make bara from this flag, inshallah. This is the building where the uh, the, the soldiers of the Safawi, the Murtadin, used to be. This is the checkpoint close to the border. This is the place where, where they used to be. See, full of kufr and shirk. As you can see, there are weapons and swords and the Iraqi flag, but they're, they're nothing but cowards. They only run away. Look. Iraqi army. There is no way army here. Jish Iraqi. Where is the Jish? The soldiers, they took this off the uniforms and they threw the uniforms in the streets and they ran away like they were civilians, found like cowards. There is no army in the world that can stand the soldiers of the Islam, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> The raya, the raya of Tawheed will, inshallah, be above all other flags of Shirk and Kufr, inshallah. There's no nationality, we are Muslims, there's only one country. Inshallah, we, all, we will also have only one Imam, only one Khalifa, inshallah, and that will be Abu Bakr Baghdad, inshallah, Hafidhullah. They've got their opinion on Sykes Pico. What do they think about it? They think that there should be, quote unquote, listen to that spokesman, no such thing as national borders. There will only be one entity, and it is the caliphate. Look at that individual by himself. Did you see what it said at the bottom? He's an English-speaking jihadi spokesman for ISIS who's from Chile. Think about that for a second. National identity, national borders mean nothing. So what should our take on Sykes-Pico be? You've seen this map already. Yes, it is not an ideal solution. Okay, a hundred years ago, this is not an ideal solution. But what was the reality of the Ottoman Empire a hundred years ago? Could you have done any better if we'd given you the job of stabilizing a totally decrepit and internally bankrupt multi-ethnic organization and polity like the Ottoman Empire? It's not exactly an easy task. And on top of that, I think it's already been mentioned, the conventional wisdoms are wrong. This wasn't a redrawing of borders, it was what? A mapping of influence after a global war. Which nation would have greater influence? The Allies did this again in World War II. Stalin had a deal with Churchill. This is nothing new. So don't believe the hype. It wasn't ideal, but it wasn't the West redrafting borders in what was a simple and easy to govern territory. Let's bring it up to date. You've seen this map. How would you like to have to sort that out? Do you have a simple solution for that? Where are you going to draw lines? What are you going to do with Iraq? 
there's only one nation there that's even slightly homogenous, and that's Iran. Is it our job to solve that problem? I'm not so sure. So, let's have a look at the question of nation states today. And I'd like to ask you to think about one thing we discussed in our uh, classroom earlier this morning. How is this problem indicative of the broader question of whether the nation state system is adequately functioning today, and the question of how nation states relate to the function of war. We have been at war now for the longest period since 1776. How would you grade our performance in that war? And what do you expect in the future, especially from the MENA region? Let me show you just some photographs from around the world and ask yourself about the role of the nation state, who our enemies are, and how they function, and whether it's Westphalian. Just a couple of snapshots. Upper left-hand corner is what? The girls of Chibok, Nigeria, who were taken hostage by Boko Haram, which is an affiliate of ISIS, for what reason? Why were they taken hostage? Because they're Christians. That was their sin. And that's why they became jihadi slaves or jihadi brides. Upper right-hand corner, we have what? A nation-state soldier. We have a representative of the Hashemite Jordanian Air Force, captured after doing a bombing run, who was then burnt alive on an ISIS video. No, this man is not a Christian, not a Sunni. He's not even a Shia. ISIS hates Shia. Who is this man? He is a Sunni, like ISIS, and yet they burn him alive. Bottom right-hand corner, who is that? One of two American, one of two African descent jihadis who waited outside an army base in the UK until Private Rigby came out they ran him over with their vehicle at 40 miles an hour. As he was dying on the tarmac, they got out their butcher knives and decapitated him. Not on the streets of Mogadishu, or on the streets of the UK, one of our allies. Then we have mentioned already Brussels in the middle, and then the left-hand photograph. This is a photograph much closer to home. Not very many newspapers ran it, but maybe you can guess who that is. Bottom left-hand corner, thank you, San Bernardino. That is Mr. Farouk of Farouk and Malik. I do a lot of lecturing for law enforcement, including the FBI, and I always say, what is the photograph they showed us after they got him? Do you remember? It was the black SUV, yeah? The black SUV full of almost 400 bullet holes, right? They dump their ARs and their Glocks into them. And I always like to point out, 400 rounds fired into the vehicle. But let's cuff him, just in case. You can never be too sure. You can never be too sure. But seriously, what is the nature of the threat environment, and how does it relate to any legacy, whether it's Sykes, Speaker or not? Let me share with you this diagram to illustrate the wars that you will have to get comfortable with. This is from an article that I wrote five years ago with David Kilcullen, who was General Petraeus's uh, counterinsurgency advisor. The article you can download it online. It's from the Chairman's Magazine, Joint Forces Quarter Quarterly. It's a critique of FM324. But I just want to share with you one diagram, and it's this one. There is a very useful open source database at the University of Pennsylvania called the Correlates of War Project. The co-relates the Correlates of War Project. It has collected all the metadata from every war since Napoleon. So from 1815, right up to OEF, OIF, and our JSOC deployments today. When did the war begin? Who was involved? How many casualties? How did it end? All, all in one giant database. Great research asset. But we just did one thing with this database. We took the giant collection, and we decided to divide the wars in the database 
into conventional ones between nation states and ones that did not involve nation states and fall into the irregular category. And this is what we found. Since Napoleon, so in the last 200 years, there have been 460 wars in the world. 460. Of 460, less than 20%, the red box, fall into conventional warfare. Meaning, one nation deploys its uniformed military to fight the uniformed military of another nation, like World War I, World War II, or Gulf I. Of the 460, more than 80% fall into the regular warfare category. Largest category is the blue category. Wars in which people like yourselves, uniformed militaries are deployed to fight non-state actors. Whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's ISIS, or whether it's the Barbary pirates 200 years ago off the coasts of Tripoli. With a small subset, being the yellow box, wars in which there are no nation-state assets deployed, such as tribal warfare. So what does this tell us about the way we as a nation think about war and the labels that we use in our joint pubs? What does it tell us about our categorizations? They're 180 degrees out of whack. What we call conventional warfare, the kinds of wars we are comfortable with, are the rarest kind. We should call that category irregular or anomalous. The kinds of messy, untidy, difficult wars we've been fighting for the last 15 years, that is not irregular or unconventional. It is war. We have to completely rethink the, the role of the nation state and how war is utilized. Because look at our favorite enemy today. Look at ISIS for a moment. Uh, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about some work we did. We did a two-year project for General Cleveland uh, CG at USASOC. One of the things we were trying to communicate to DC is that ISIS is different. ISIS is truly post-Westphalian. It totally demolishes everything we expect with regard to the nation state. Here's an old map about where ISIS is functioning. ISIS functions today in Iraq, Syria, Libya. It holds territory bigger than the United Kingdom. It has six million people on its territory. Not only that, Boko Haram is now a part of ISIS. ISIS accepted Boko Haram, which means territory in Western Nigeria is actually part of the caliphate. Now this, you know all this stuff, but think about that in historic perspective. In the last hundred years, pick any insurgent group, doesn't matter whether it's Mao in China or FARC in Colombia, what was the goal of the insurgent group always? They always had the same objective. What was it? To take down the government they were fighting, yes? To defeat them and replace them. Every insurgent we, we, we have been used to analyzing and fighting only wanted to take down one government. What about ISIS? ISIS is a little bit more ambitious. This is the world's first transnational, transregional insurgency, holding territory in multiple countries in multiple regions, the Middle East, North Africa, and West Africa. This by itself should make us think twice about the future wars we have to prepare for, and the role of nation-state constructs like Sykes-Picot. Also, we need to understand what motivates our enemies today. You've heard um, the presentation on the role of ideology. I couldn't agree more. Do you know what ISIS is fighting for? Yes, a caliphate. We know that. But do you know what ISIS calls themselves? Did you hear what he said in the video? He kept talking about al-Sham. Do you know what that is, al-Sham? Al-Sham is a religious phrase from Islam. It means this territory in the Middle East, greater Syria or the Levant. It's where we get our USG acronyms 
of ISIS or ISIL. But it isn't just a geographic descriptor. If you understand your history of Islam, you will also understand that al-Sham is an eschatological term, meaning it has to do with end times, with judgment day. If you remember your Christian eschatology, before judgment day, we expect what? Tribulation. We expect conflict between the Antichrist and the last true Christians. Well, guess what? Islam has a very similar eschatology. Before judgment day by Allah, there will be a series of mighty battles across the world between the forces of the infidel and the last true Muslims. And guess what our sham is? Our sham is the Megiddo. It is the site of the last jihad in Muslim eschatology, meaning it is where the last war with the infidel will occur before Judgment Day. Now try and get out of your skin for a second and think about how that resonates with a 17-year-old Muslim kid in his mom's basement. He's fantasized about being a jihadi, about the 72 virgins, about salvation. And what message is ISIS pumping out every day? They have more than 50,000 social media postings every 24 hours coming out of ISIS. And when they say, like that English language spokesman says, we are the Islamic State of Al-Sham, what message is he sending to that young man? Oh, you wanted to become a jihadi? Clocks are ticking. Look where we are. We've captured the site of the last jihad. If you ever wanted to be a jihadi, you better come on down now. There is no other way to explain how they have recruited 38,000 foreign fighters in just a couple of years. They live in a post-Westphalian world where things like Sykes-Picot must be crushed because Judgment Day is just around the corner. The nice thing about the enemy we face today is that unlike some people would wish to believe, they're not crazy, they're not capricious, and they're not random. If you go to our PME institutions, especially senior uh, college, what are you going to be studying till the cows come home? Clausewitz, right? McKinder, Boyd, Spikeman, all of this stuff, yeah? Well, guess what? The bad guys have their Clausewitzes, have their Mackinders, have their Boyds, and these are the three most important. If you want to understand how the enemy has utter disregard for everything the West has created, such as Sykes-Picot or the nation state, you need to read these people. This is what I teach. This is my, my day job. Whether I'm at Swick or Tampa, I try and teach how you get inside the mind of the enemy. People like this Egyptian, Saeed Qutb, who came to America after World War II and studied us very closely for two years. After living here in America, he concluded that we are a godless, sex-obsessed, materialistic society. When I say that at Bragg, the guys just look at me and go, Bad news is, he concluded that, and then he went back to Egypt and he wrote the book on how to destroy us and why we must be destroyed. It's called Milestones. It is the FM of global jihad. It's a thin little book that we've captured on HVTs in every theater, every theater. I'm going to be mentioning several books. If you want any of these, I can provide them electronically as uh, English language unclassed PDFs. So... We have some uh, sign-up sheets. If you want any of the jihadi documents or our ISIS reports, give me your email and I'll send them to you when we get back to D.C. Saeed Qutb, jihad must be done now because in his book he says the following thing. Listen to what he says. I'm a Muslim and I'm writing to the Muslim world. All of you must understand that Islam isn't a religion. It is a political movement with a global mandate to re-establish the caliphate to the glory of God. Islam isn't what you do at home five times a day or in the mosque on Friday. It is a globally mandated supremacist political movement. 
This is where the story of modern jihad begins, Saad Qutb. Then we move to Abdullah Azam. Abdullah Azam is important for two reasons. He's the true creator of Al-Qaeda. He created the Arab Services Bureau in Pakistan after the Soviets invaded, and he hired UBL as his XO. Bin Laden worked for this guy. He is more important, though, not because he created Al-Qaeda, because he issued a fatwa in 1979 in which he stated, Jihad is not an option. Jihad is mandatory. Why did he say that? Because the infidel has just invaded Muslim soil, Soviet Union and Afghanistan, and we don't have a caliph to declare war anymore. Nobody's going to get their deployment orders because the Turkish Republic dissolved the caliphate. So you must deploy yourself. You must grab a gun and become a jihadi. That document was the most important mobilizational tool to jihad until ISIS said the caliphate is back and Abu Bakr anointed himself as the caliph. Lastly, most important of all, and this is where you really understand how the jihadi movement lives in a post-Sykes, Pico, post-Westphalian world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you only read one book on the mind of jihad in your professional career, it really needs to be Brigadier S.K. Malik's Quranic concept of war. This is the Bible of the jihadi movement. This is the most important document that you can read to understand the threat environment today and in the future. This is a Pakistani general who writes a book in 1979 with three very simple messages. Message number one, forget Clausewitz. War has nothing to do with politics. You know, war, you know, politics by other means, wrong, he says. War has only one purpose and one purpose alone, the realization of Allah's sovereignty through the recreation of the caliphate in a war, period. All war must only serve the interests of God by recreating the religious empire. Second message, a rejection of Clausewitz, but also Germany. He says, when you go to war, ignore what the infidel does. He does his IPBs, and the infidel looks for what? Centers of gravity, key vulnerabilities, those targets that if we hit them hard enough, the enemy is going to crumble. Malik says, wrong. There's no such thing as key vulnerabilities or centers of gravity. There's only one target in warfare and one target alone, the soul of the infidel. You must convert them or you must crush them. Which leads to the last part of the book, which is the scariest, because it links it directly to later events like 9-11, Fort Hood, the Boston bombing, all the decapitations we see today, the crucifixions. Malik concludes, because the soul of the infidel is the only target that matters, the most effective mode of war is terror. Yeah? Very un-Westphalian. If you want to crush the infidel's will to fight, more pressure cooker bombs at marathons, more 9-11s. That's how the jihadis will win. If you want those documents, please um, give us your email and we'll send them to you. I want to skip that and go straight to the so what. What does this mean? What does this mean? Number one, if we go back to the Sykes Pico, just look at the map of the Middle East and North Africa today. The idea that the West is responsible for the violence is utterly fallacious. There was no silver bullet. There was no way to stabilize that region of the world, whoever was drawing lines on a map. Secondly, pre-Westphalian structures and identities have been reasserted. As anyone who goes to the region and who serves there knows, when push comes to shove, where does loyalty usually revert back to? It reverts back to the older structure that provides security, which is going to be your clan or your tribe. Look at what happened in Iraq. You can talk as much as you like about federal government and an Iraqi state, but when 200 jihadis come down the road in technicals in Mosul in June of 2014, what happens to the Iraqi army? Everybody pops smoke and runs home to their tribal group. Yeah? Why? Because that's where the identity is located. Who's looked after me for the last 300 years? It's my tribe, it's my clan. 
with the very rare exceptions, perhaps the Hashemite kingdom being one of them, this is what we are seeing. Reversion to pre-Westphalian structures and identities. Thirdly, if you self-censor any of the above truths, as we have seen in the last 15 years, an attempt to white out the role of ideology and religion and tribal identity. Yeah? In DC, where I live, in Babylon, the, the government wishes to convict. It's, you know, I mean, come on, really. The, 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 po the people in suits would have you believe that religion and ideology has nothing to do with this war. Yeah? You've heard the deputy, deputy spokeswoman for the State Department go on national television and say what? We will be safe from another 9-11 if we have jobs for jihadis. Yeah? It's all about unemployment and lack of education. Does she have any idea who the 19 hijackers were? None of them was born in a Palestinian refugee camp. Most of them have postgraduate degrees from well-to-do families. Yeah? We have created a fantasy analysis of where the threat comes from. And we, we deny that at our peril, the reality, because what we will do is commit ourselves and condemn ourselves to continuing what we've done for the last 15 years, which really is best described as whack-a-mole. Yeah? I mean, we're good at it. J you give J you know, JSOC a GPS and you're toast, right? Within 72 hours, you're gone. Yeah? But what if 15 guys volunteered to replace the one guy you killed? It's whack-a-mole. Your kids, my grandkids will be fighting this war unless we delegitimize the ideology that motivates the recruitment. And lastly, the region will only be stabilized if the enemy threat doctrines, the ideologies of these groups, are delegitimized by America and her Sunni partners. Don't get me wrong, yeah? Don't get me wrong. This isn't about a war with Islam. That's asinine. Who are the majority of the victims of ISIS? Right, they'll kill Christians and Jews, but by far, by, by factors, the majority of the victims are, are the Muslims, not even Shia. Yeah, in parts of Iraq, it's Sunnis who disagree with ISIS that are getting crucified. So, how do we win this war? I don't want to deploy the 82nd Airborne or one MEF back into theater. I would like to see our Sunni partners be the face of this war. But as, I, as you all know, in the region, what is the likelihood of that happening by itself? Zero, unless we embed uh, junior officers, NCOs, right down to brigade level across the region, they will not hold the line. They won't even leave the barracks on that, unless they believe we have their six. And sadly, what has the Sunni world learned in the last 15 years about America's commitment to the Middle East? Yeah. When I have three-star GOs tell me, that when they go into the region, nobody trusts them. You know what I say? Are you surprised, sir? Yeah? We went in there. We didn't break the China in the China shop. We, we detonated a claymore in the China shop and then popped smoke and went home. See, you guys, we won, right? Yeah? That's not how you build long-term relationships. So whoever the next president is, they have a lot of bridges to rebuild, and I do not envy them. But the face of this war should be our Sunni allies with us behind them. Okay, to conclude, if you want to go deeper, uh, this is a very short presentation. Um, actually, this month's issue of Military Review has uh, an article on the masterminds of jihad. You can uh, check that out. It should already be here on the base. And if you want to get into the real mindset of the enemy, then check out a book my wife published a few years ago called Fighting the Ideological War, Winning Strategies from Communism to Islamism. We took the very best national security practitioners from the National Security Council under Reagan. We put them in a room with the very best experts on jihadi ideology today, and we said, you took down the totalitarians in Moscow. You understand the totalitarianism of the jihadis. Give us a game plan for this war. And that's the book that resulted. That's Catherine Gorka with a K. And then finally, I've always wanted to do this. For seven years, people have said, okay, smarty pants, how would you do it? And so I decided to tell you. And I just wrote a book, and it's available on Amazon.
actually, I think it's available outside in the back. So Defeating Jihad just came out. What I did is I took the template from the Cold War of the Long Telegram and NSC-68, the plan to defeat the Soviets, and I applied it to the current threat. So the first half of the book is what do the bad guys believe, what are the sources of their strategy, and the second half of the book is how to take them down, at least one guy's opinion as to what the next commander-in-chief could do. All right, so uh, those are some things for some light reading. Um, and if you'd like to stay in touch, uh, you may want to bookmark a few of these. If you want to ask me a question offline in private, best way to reach me is my Gmail, seb.gorker at gmail.com. My Twitter handle is the same with no dot to Seb Gorka. Everything that I do for public consumption or my analysis, my media, is on my site, thegorkabriefing.com. There's actually a 12-part video lecture on ISIS if you really want to get uh, you know, into the details. Um, everything we do for USASOC, for uh, the IC, for the FBI, is through our commercial site, threatknowledge.org. We have two ISIS reports on class. You can download from there. That's threatknowledge.org. And then lastly, if you want to keep up on what, how the threat is evolving, my wife runs a, a foundation called the Council on Global Security that monitors the evolution of jihadi ideology. So what's the latest trends in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia? That's the uh, councilongloballsecurity.org. So my site, our commercial site that supports the warfighter, and lastly, the ideology one. That's all she wrote. So if you want any more, Give us your email, and we'll send those to you once I'm back. Thank you. Dr. Gorka, thanks so much. And I think this is probably the appropriate time to say that our speakers speak for themselves today and do not re represent DOD or United States government policy. And so this is a, this is a creative way to make sure that this is uh, not the attribution environment to uh, blame the United States government. All right, so now we open up to questions. So this is the interactive part. I think we've got some folks who are going to haul the microphones from the front. Uh, this is for whoever cares to answer it. I'm Lieutenant Captain Hoffman. That's new. <laughs> and um, my question is, why have these borders been so stable? Uh, despite everyone's belief that they're illegitimate, that this is the ongoing narrative, uh, go back 100 or 98 years ago, five months and 26 days, and four empires collapsed, not just one. The borders of... Eastern Europe have been in a state of flux. They have been rewritten, some of them three times. Poland has moved 100 miles to its west. It was repartitioned, and yet the Middle Eastern borders have functionally not changed since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, although most people would say those were the most illegitimate. After all, the borders of Eastern Europe had much more input as to what the local populace thought. So why have these borders proven more stable than the other collapsed empires, given the factors working on them? All right, thanks for the great question. Um, I'll give a short answer and see if my uh, colleagues have a response. I would ask you this question. Um, how would you characterize this region in terms of oppressive and heavy-handed governance? probably tops in the world, right? So they go hand in hand. What would it take to change the borders? It would take a great deal of bottom-up collective action, sacrifice, sustained over time, drawing in the government seeking to protect those borders into something that results in a redrawing. And if you redraw borders, you're then affecting a whole bunch of other stakeholders who, again, the region with the most, I would argue, in the last 100 years, heavy-handed governance in the world, trying to preserve individually their own patches of the soccer ball. Collectively, what you get is a historic period of oppressive governance, whether it is 
oppressive in its secularism, distrustful of religious um, constituents and citizens, or oppressive in its interpretation of the majority religion. I'm thinking of Saudi Arabia and Iran, for example. But in almost every case, I think the heavy handedness of governance has kept pace with the instability and the dissatisfaction or discord experienced at civil society. In the end, what you get is a bit of a draw, and that is a form of stable equilibrium, but a particularly brutal and unfavorable form for those who live in the region. Uh, I, I just add one thing. Uh, absolutely, uh, you know, if you're if you're living in an authoritarian regime, it's not hard to secure your borders. And secondly, it's also not true, especially in North Africa. Uh, in lots of places, there are no borders. People go back and forth every day because they don't recognize them. So it's it's a combination of the two. It's fake borders and it's borders that were enforced because they were non-democratic regimes. I agree with um, those previous, but I'm going to, and I'm going to give a little bit of a different take as well. Um, one of the things also to think about is uh, what constitutes, if we're thinking about the future of states and recognition, and thinking about the as as going back even to the colonial period in that way, the game uh, that the states themselves play and what incentives they may have to, or not to create new states or redraw borders. In some of these cases, especially if you're thinking about the instability that may have resulted around, let's say, um, in various periods of time, uh, Jordan, as far as being a buffer, in a sense, a buffer zone between Israel and, we'll say, other Arab states there in that direction. Um, if you think of those states as, as existing for that region of many of the other states not wanting that state to fail or, or for that very reason and not going too far. A good example might also be a question of assuming that there is some type of uh, generalized collective Kurdish identity that exists across four states in that region. One of the reasons, and especially particularly with, say, Iraqi and we'll say um, uh, in the, the Kurds and Iraqi population as well as the, uh, the Turks, Neither of them may have had an incentive to go too far in supporting the other the other countries' uh, Kurdish populations. And they've played around in those various populations, but but there was an equilibrium that was established as such that that there was a, be a considerable risk to have done that and uh, and to throw this entire region in part because there may be these blowback effects, and we're not even sure what they're going to happen. So I would also say, seeing at that regional level um, that existed, there there were considerable risks to overturning this system that they at least knew and, and knew would exist. Uh, sir, I'm Major Ali from Pakistan. Uh, sir, before I ask any question, uh, I would like to tell all my friends that uh, the ISIS uh, does not represent the, the Islam or ideology of Islam. Uh, they don't even represent the, uh, the human beings. Like the, the operations they, they conduct, the kind of uh, violence they conduct. So what we believe is that they don't even humans. All right. So... My question is, sir, uh, you mentioned the skype Spico agreement. You related with the uh, Al-Shams area, Al-Sham area. So keeping in view the uh, relation with ISIS operations with sykes Pico, uh, why the ISIS is not conducting any operation inside the state of Israel? Since Israel is the, you know, the center of all the uh, holy places that you have mentioned. And for the last few years, we haven't uh, witnessed any of the operation of ISIS in that area. So this, this question always, uh, I always kept this in my mind whenever I study the uh, ISIS. Thank you. Uh, I'd, uh, sorry, I'd ask you, why do you think because that's a pretty loaded question. Why do you think they don't do it? As learned, learned as you are, sir. So that's ah, <laughs> nicely dodged. Nicely dodged. Not dodged. Uh... No, I'm curious. Why would you ask that question? What's the motivation for that? So it's, it's because it's a really weird question. Why would you ask that question? It's, it's a logical question, sir. You show me the map. So ISIS is conducting all the operations towards the east. Right. So why do you think it? 
Why are they not attacking Israel? I don't know, sir. You tell me. I think you do. I just don't think you want to say it. I, I, I don't know, sir. Seriously, I don't know. I'm being serious, too. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I'm not going to play the conspiracy theory game. Okay, I know the Middle East doesn't run on oil. It runs on conspiracies. Okay, uh, that's the fuel of the region. Uh, I don't play that game. Um, but if you read, it's one of the slides I, I didn't show you. There is a game plan for what ISIS does. It's actually called uh, The Management of Savagery. It's a book by an Egyptian called Abu Bakr Naji. And it's very clear there that ISIS is following a, a campaign plan where they have priorities. Good, good strategy is actually based upon choosing priorities. That's why we're in such a mess in the United States, because we don't have priorities, right? If you read the NSS, we're going to save the whales, save the polar bears, and do major theater wars at the same time, right? We, we just don't prioritize anymore. Uh, the enemy does. The enemy's priority right now is not Israel. The, think about what they've done. On June 29, 2014, ISIS declared the reestablishment of the caliphate, which has been absent for 90 years. If you declare a theocratic empire, what must you do next? You've got to govern it. Yes? This is their challenge. It's like the, the dog that yaps at the bus every morning going past, but one day actually jumps and bites the bus and catches it. What are you going to do now? So the priority, the five meter target for ISIS is governance. You've got to provide electricity, healthcare, water. They'll get to Israel sooner or later, and I can assure you they will get to Israel, but that's the 25, 50 meter target. If I'm in the Jock, if I'm in the Shura Council of ISIS, my priority is governance of the caliphate. Next, I must take down Jordan. I must prove the Hashemites are not true Muslims, and then I must take Saudi Arabia, and then I'll get to Israel. So this is a multi-phased approach, and trust me, they have a plan, and it's not about conspiracy theories. We have time for two more questions. Maybe one in the, one in the middle here. Lieutenant Colonel Payne, uh, for Dr. Gorka, you said that, you stated that the solution to violent extremism is to delegitimize the ideology by working with, with the host nation partners of, of whatever that area is. But much of the response to the Middle Eastern ideology is a rejection of Western society, Western culture, and our cultural norms. So why do we think that American involvement to delegitimize that is, is going to work? Isn't it just the very fact that we're involved and they reject our culture, in fact, delegitimizing our partners in the region to be able to do that? And is some of what we've been doing for the last 15 years, so why do we think more of the same is going to be successful? Great question. Um, we haven't been doing ideological warfare for 15 years. We've been doing tactical. If you talk to our PSYOP units in Bragg, they're great, but they're not allowed to do strategic I.O. Um, it's not our job to be the face of it. It has to be King Abdullah of Jordan. It has to be President Sisi of Egypt. But we don't support them. During the Cold War, think about it. In the Cold War, the CIA owned complete publishing houses in Europe. I mean, just whole publishing houses owned by Langley. We don't do any of that. We don't support any of the very brave Muslims that are pushing back on jihadi ideology right now. We don't touch them because they talk about religion and Foggy Bottom and Langley won't touch that. So it's not about our overt victory ideologically. It's about helping those best positioned to win the ideological war and to delegitimize them. Your, your point is well taken but it's not about our face on that product. And I would just add very quickly, <clears throat> in some ways this is what I was trying to get at with the ping pong ball analogy. Um, when you understand it's a them versus them, majority versus minority, you shift your focus a little bit, right? From crashing through um, uh, those we might otherwise engage and focusing only on those who present a threat. That's kind of a short-term view. I'll give you one quick example in Afghanistan and where we tried to do this. Minister Niazi, uh, PhD in Islamic jurisprudence, was the minister of Hajj and religious affairs. We worked with him and ISAF, and he said, it is my goal to promote positive Islamic norms throughout the four corners of Afghanistan, wherever Afghans gather, in mosques, universities, prisons, and at the end of a TV or radio signal. And he said, I have a plan to do this. I'm going to use literacy through the Ministry of Education. 
I'm going to partner with the Minister of Tribal and Border Affairs, and we're going to get mosques to teach literacy, but in doing so, they're going to teach a positive form of Islam that will serve Afghanistan going forward. He asked ISAF and the U.S. Embassy for $1,500 to buy paper and toner cartridge so that he could have a 250-person religious leader jirga in Kabul. Do you have any idea how long it took us to get clearance on that $1,500, which is nothing, it's couch cushions? Um, three to four months. Once we did finally persuade the State Department that we were not engaging on the content of the religious ideas, but we were partnering with a positive actor who shared our interest in the future of Afghanistan, they gave us the $1,500, he had the jirga, and when it was all over, he gave us $800 back. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of us <laughs> providing um, grant-like aid to another actor. So it's a microcosm example of things that we've tried to do, but having done it on a serious scale, I actually think the paradigm is just now shifting to where people are becoming serious at this. Last point, there's an office in the State Department now called Religion and Global Affairs, headed up by a guy named Sean Casey. There were two people in that office just over a year ago. There are 30 people in the office now. Doesn't mean everything they're doing is exactly right, but he has access to Secretary Kerry, and they're trying to explain how this nexus between religion and faith actors and international affairs actually functions so we can have more literacy um, in this area. And the last question. We had one here in the middle. Sir, I believe you hit on this in answering your last question, but I'll ask it anyway. How important is our own strategic narrative to actually uh, combating and delegitimizing ISIS's narrative? Wow. Um, you know, Sun Tzu is probably the most misquoted strategist ever because everybody can quote Sun Tzu and say what? If you want to win, you must know the enemy, right? Wrong. What did he say in his book? He said, if you know the enemy, you will win half of your battles. If you want to win the war, you must not only know the enemy, you must know yourself and why you are fighting. I would say that in the last 15 years, we have failed with both sides of that equation. A, we're not allowed to speak honestly about who the enemy is and what they want. And secondly, we haven't been clear. Uh, when I went to Afghanistan in 06 and I looked at the, the plans for the last five years, we had changed our strategy every 10 months in Afghanistan. How can you win a war if you change? It's like it's being on a soccer pitch playing soccer and every three minutes they change the rule of the game, but they don't tell the players. Yeah. You can pick the ball up, you can't. You kick it above the posts, under the posts. I think there's a very good reason why we have 22 vets killing themselves every 24 hours in America. It's because of that. We don't have our narrative straight. Why is it that we're fighting? I think we knew in October of 01, right? We're going to do what? We're going to crush AQ. And then we had the biggest mission creep of US history for the next 15 years. If you don't know why you're fighting, it's very hard to deal with some very bad things you're going to see. But compare that to the 1940s and 1950s. How many of your granddaddies came home from the Pacific and ate a gun barrel? Very few. We did not have inordinate PTSD or suicides, even though they saw some really horrific stuff, especially in the Pacific and in the death camps. Why didn't they? commit suicide in the figures we have today because they had been told why they're fighting and why they're on the side of the angels. Even when you see something horrific, it's okay, boys, because the enemy is evil. When have you heard a speech given in D.C. by a politician that talks about the evil nature of our enemy? We don't even use words like enemy or victory. We talk about degrading our adversaries. Really? We didn't do that in World War II. Why are we doing it now? So completely, I couldn't agree more with you. We have to be clear on our narrative for you, the warfighter, because it is part of knowing how to measure your success if you decide exactly what you're doing 
and control the narrative of why you are doing it and with what tools? Great question. My, my response is going to actually go back to the previous that I, um, I didn't answer in the previous question. And I'll start with this one. As far as the narrative goes, my response is that one of the reasons we may not have a narrative is we're unsure exactly what that narrative should be and we're not necessarily in agreement. We're also, in my opinion, not sure what exactly are our priorities which we've talked about before. And it may not be the case that this is our top national security uh, priority or strategy. We've tried, we have tried, and I agree with the, maybe the part of the sentiment in the previous question, if I understood it correctly, we've tried a lot of these strategies before. And I'm in somewhat a disagreement with um, some of the other, uh, some of the, my colleagues on the panel here, that I don't think the United States should be involved in these, in these types of debates or battles, because we do tend to taint, for whatever good of purposes we have, those religious actors on the ground. Because immediately when the United States is backing anything, it is seen to be, it is seen to be corrupt, it is seen to be Western, and it's almost, in a sense, the kiss of death. It's not saying we shouldn't find ways to do that, but we should also recognize what our limitations are. And I can talk about countless times that this happened, both from my experience in the Middle East, even as far as little things such as NGOs, which had very little to do with the United States, were immediately branded impresses of some of these authoritarian regimes when they wanted to get rid of them. And, and this is the way it works in, the, in terms of the politics. So as much as we can stay out of that public eye in battle, we should. We, should. we shouldn't be backing necessarily these public, uh, these public clerics because they're going to be dismissed by their own uh, communities and territories by, uh, by many of those. And then secondly, when it gets to these priorities, we should really think, in, in, in my opinion, and this may not be in agreement with the others, of is this a type of battle? Is counter-ISIL, these, are these types of priorities we should be thinking about when it comes to broader national security issues? Or should we be thinking about bigger issues such as Russia and China and, and, these, types of, and these types of threats and put them in this type of perspective and get away, in, in, in a sense, from some of these from what happens during the campaign seasons of what might be the, the flavor of the day and what would be the most excitable movement that we can't get away from, that really mobilizes people and gets people excited, but to think sometimes these are the bigger threats. What's, what are the threats in the next 20 to 30 years, and how should we be acquisition, allocating resources to counter these threats? And now I've probably completely disagreed with my panelists. Um, I, let me just add one. Um, my view of the nature of this threat, I, I'm specifically connecting it to great power war if unchecked. Um, and so when you see China's provocations in the South China Sea, I think it's short-sighted to not recognize there's a relationship between what China is willing to do in the South China Sea and the global perception of perhaps Western reluctance or even impotence in engaging the Iraq and Syria problem. Um, and so as instability like this stokes regional rivalries and brings, as I said, great powers on either side of the rupture closer to conflict with one another, other strategic nations like China can observe this and it, it, it informs their calculations in other parts of the world. So I, I do want to make sure that we don't consign this, uh, at least in my view, we don't consign this to sort of um, uh, uh, a small compartmentalizable concern because I don't think it is. And then uh, to the the great question that's been asked. Uh, I'll just share a couple of words from an email that I wrote uh, to affirm what, what you said. Quote, if we do not get serious about specifically countering the ideological religious narrative against us, the war on terror could devolve into a global struggle of operational and tactical interdictions for generations. Even as we succeed in Iraq and Afghanistan, an enemy that is inspired to public violence by a narrative similar to... Um, what we've heard, um, uh, violent extremist narratives, w this enemy will simply not stop fighting nor lack places to which to migrate and from which to prep and stage attacks against the U.S. and its allies. Imagine whack-a-mole at the nation-state and associated regions level. Finally, the longer we wait to make this a central component of our efforts, the longer history will judge us to have been stuck in a period struggling to understand the true nature of this conflict. September 2008, while I was a member of the National Security Council. I read that because your question and the imperative to engage in a very complex space that is not playing to our strengths, but nevertheless will force us to forge 
innovative approaches and new partnerships that are just adroit enough that they don't delegitimize the actors that we're partnering with, I think is an essential component of the way ahead. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, that concludes our program for the uh, afternoon. If you give our presenters a round of applause.